Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Purang dhammang sangang namasami How's the volume for people? Okay, okay. Um, and if I know we're starting a little late, so if people need to stand up and stretch their legs, that's okay. So I think every now and again, it's really important to return to the fundamentals of practice. There's such high wisdom teachings in the Buddha's dispensation that we can sometimes get lost in contemplating them in the different ways the Buddha parsed out experience, attachment, liberation, and forget to turn attention to what we're doing on the cushion and in our daily life just every day. There's a saying that if you want to get people out to sea, you don't need to teach them to build a ship, but rather teach them to love the ocean. And that's a quote that sounds really nice, but I think it actually speaks to a reverse of the dilemma most practitioners and people find themselves in we want so badly to be at peace, to be happy. We want so badly to be kind and forgiving, to not be angry. And yet we don't know how to get from here to there. And where the Buddha's teachings shine is they teach us how to build the ship. The Buddha left us 22,000 pages worth of teachings. They were all spoken at the time, but written out, they're 12 times the length of the Bible, 45 years of constant instruction. There's passages in the suttas time and again where the Buddha wakes and surveys uh, the world and the environment near him and intuits one person or two that might be able to understand his words. And then he'll walk 10 or 15 or 20 miles to go see them and to speak. There's stories of him walking through the city and as a noble of Katya, warrior caste, people of uh, different castes, lepers, sick, scramble to get out of the way of such a noble. And he'll stop and turn to them and he'll teach them without regard for caste, for social position, just as a fellow human being out of compassion. And he did this time and again over 45 years. And what he left us with is such a profound teaching, the Dhamma, the dispensation, which has come to us through 2,500 years of the rise and fall of empires, of social upheavals, of war, of famine. And it's such a gift. And the Buddha would say, when you practice, you show respect you show gratitude to your teacher. So this is how we show our gratitude for this gift for the Dhamma in our lives is we take the time to every day rededicate ourselves to purifying the heart for the sake of our own happiness and the welfare of the many. And we do this by building the ship little by little, by finding a wellspring of happiness internally. The Buddha said the prime 
relationship many of us have with the world is one of feeding, upadana, which is the same word you use for flames, feeding off of fuel, clinging, burning, reducing to ash. And the change, you'll hear in the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, the chant we just recited together, this phrase again and again, knowledge arose, vision arose, light arose. And this is the essential switch in the Buddhist practice, is one from the energy of feeding, of fire, clinging, agitated, bound, to the energy of light, cool, radiant, boundless blessing. We switch from feeding off of the world to blessing the world. And this sounds nice, but without an internal wellspring of happiness, we're forced to feed off of the world, and we have nothing to give it. The Buddha, in some suttas, compares a practitioner going off to the wilderness to practice alone without any sense of internal serenity to a cat who sees an elephant playing in a pond and decides to jump into the pond and play too. And it is not happy. <laughs> so it's one of my favorite analogies in the suttas. So how do we turn from a uh, bedraggled, damp cat into uh, a practitioner with a sense of steadiness and an internal well-being? The Buddha spoke of three different levels of happiness. There's amis, uh, samisasukha or amisasukha, fleshly happiness, happiness dependent on feeding off of the five cords of sensuality, pleasant tastes, pleasant touches, sights, sounds, smells. And this is fragile and hot and burning and it reduces in effectiveness over time. And then he spoke about niramisasukha, spiritual happiness, which is the happiness from the calm mind, the happiness of blameless virtue, the happiness of loving kindness. And this is anti-fragile, it's our own. If the body goes, if the relationships falter, this is an inner wellspring which we maintain. And the final level of happiness is nibbana, which is unshakable. And it's a bit, Ajahn Jayasaro compares niramisasukha, spiritual happiness, to winning the lottery. Someone might continue to work in a job to have something to do, but they'll never cheat to get ahead in their job. They'll never compromise their sila. And similarly, when we have this inner wellspring of happiness through meditation, then we can interact with the world with a light touch. And we don't have to feed off of those around us because it's impossible to love something at the same time as you're feeding off of it. So we're learning to love, and that comes from the practical development of skill in internal cultivation. The word the Buddha used to speak about what we develop on this path is kusala, which is related to the word for kusa grass, which is a sharp grass. And if you grab it wrong, it slices the hand. So you have to be skilled and delicate and knowledgeable when you pull kusa grass. And similarly, we're learning skill. How to build the ship. So one useful thing is really getting our tools together for this. When the Buddha spoke about meditation, he gave us an enormous spectrum of means. In the West, often people are taught simply to place awareness on one word or point at the breath, which is spotlight awareness, or to let whatever comes up arise without, dis without any sort of discernment. And this is lantern awareness. 
And Alice Gopnik, a psychologist in Berkeley, uh, University of Berkeley, points to a third sort of awareness beyond spotlight and lantern, narrow and wide, and that's play awareness, playfulness, experimentation. And this is the correct orientation towards our meditation practice because rather than becoming a dry exercise in willpower to return to the same object again and again, it gives us breadth of means and experimentation and interest. We're developing skill. And instead of just entering this practice with a screwdriver, we have a whole tool belt. And it's okay at the beginning of practice and throughout it to develop these different tools, try different techniques. The narrative you hear often, which is just keep at that same object, even if it's become dry and rote, and one of these days things will just snap into focus. There may be some who that works for, but for many of us, you have to play. And Odd Tanpur Lee sort of uses the analogy of eggs. You don't learn about eggs just by staring at an egg. You make an omelet, you make a scrambled egg, um, you make a quiche. So we use the activity of the mind to learn about the mind. So the framework for all sorts of this play in meditation uh, needs to always be the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha gave two categorical teachings always applicable, and that's the Four Right Efforts and the Four Noble Truths. The first noble truth is to comprehend dukkha, suffering. And so often we sit down and the temptation is to jump right to the fourth noble truth of the path. We want to jump straight into a technique or spreading loving kindness to people or some other activity. And we don't realize that we're bypassing the first noble truth of just acknowledging often the backlog of bruising, of disappointment, of suffering, which we're entering the meditation with. So the first noble truth is first for a reason. Before you begin into a technique in a sit, can you take a second and just say, what's here right now? What's in my heart? And rather than jumping to some new activity or technique, Can you just take the second to listen carefully to what's there in the heart? Acknowledge it. Let it be seen and um, held. And this can also be, the Four Noble Truths can also be a practice in and of themselves, where when the mind wanders, uh, you can recognize that it's wandered. Thanks, Kirk. I'm not quite sure how to get this out. We'll just take the whole stand. Good idea. <laughs> so um, one recognizes it wa it's wandered. And just recognize and return to a place of centered spaciousness. And just taste the difference between those two modes of being. Centered in a place of spacious awareness versus off on some train of thought. And the sense of bound narrowness and heat when you're chasing after a defilement or a hindrance versus the sense of spaciousness, calm, and centeredness when you return to the center. And there's one uh, technique called the six R's, which really spell this process out beautifully and is always applicable in meditation. So when the mind wanders, you recognize that it's wandered. You uh, relax. Uh, the sense of tension which might have manifested um, with that uh, wandering. Usually when you have a thought, there will be a physical correlate of tension, usually in the forehead or eyes. Thank you. Uh, so relax that. Re-smile. So bring a gentle smile to the inside of your mouth. Return to your meditation object and repeat. And I believe that's only five, but I've forgotten one of them. So it's recognize, relax, re-smile. Oh, no, okay, recognize, release, release. Thank you, thank you, Mom. Um, return to the meditation object, re-smile. 
Okay, let's do one more time, everyone. <laughs> Recognize, release, re-smile, re relax, re-smile, return, repeat. Good. We'll just keep doing that together. <laughs> so this is the process by which we come back to that centered place. But it's astounding how often people skip the first noble truth. And that's the spiritual bypassing. So really to take a second in every session uh, and returning to that and just acknowledging what's there. The other thing to keep in mind is during your daily life, how are you maintaining that thread of awareness? And an important part of the practice is developing a tiered practice where depending on how coarse your mind is or your mental or your activity is, adjusting your meditation practice to align. So a very, uh, one of the more kind of coarse or grounding meditation objects is a mantra. So having some word that really resonates with your heart. It might be love. Budo is a very common one in the Thai forest tradition. It means awake, calm, friendliness. And just maintaining that uh, in a conversation after you've spoken, when you're listening, can you keep 25% of your attention with a mantra? A more subtle object is the breath, seeing if you can track it in and out, down through the nose to the belly and back up. Another one is just the sense of the body. Can you maintain this sort of embodied awareness? And during the workday, every 15 minutes or an hour, can you just stop, turn off the screen, close your eyes for five minutes, and just recenter? And one profound, useful way to bring yourself back to center is a lot of these techniques require split in awareness between the activity and that object of mindfulness. But the sense of loving kindness, it infuses awareness itself. So if you're in the midst of a lot of activity, I find this is an extremely stable object or grounding of mindfulness is just a sense of loving kindness. Can you approach every interaction with the, the intention to make the person in front of you feel as cared for, as loved, as appreciated, as forgiven as possible? And somehow this can let you move through environments of extreme activity or difficulty and you find that they don't leave any mark. You sit down and there's just a sense of care. And then one very useful, skillful means is noting practice. So this just, it's as simple as when anger comes up, just labeling it anger, sadness, resentment. And there's a function of mindfulness called putting things into order through being mindful. And often what you find is when you find the right word for something, it just settles it. And so when you can't return to some certain object during the day, can you just label what's going on in the mind and trust that? Now when we sit, I think a good analogy for how to develop play in meditation is cooking. So some of you heard me talk about this before, but the Buddha compares a skilled practitioner to a cook and he says, here a bhikkhu, a practitioner, practices observing body within the body, feelings within feelings, mind within mind, dhamma categories within dhamma categories, the four satipatthana or foundations of mindfulness. While obser observing the body within the body, their mind does not become centered, does not come to calm. The bhikkhu does not take note of that fact. Just as a cook, might make a dish for their master and not take note of whether the master likes it or not. Such an unskilled cook is similar to such a practitioner. So we want to become skilled cooks for the mind. What is the mind hungry for? And usually having two primary meditation objects can be very useful. Throughout the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, the refrain is the practitioner breathes in and out. That's always there. The breath is a very good base dish. It's rice. But then 
with the 16 steps of the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, there's also, in each of those steps, usually, a secondary training, a secondary object that overlays the breath, that supplements the breath. So this is the curry, a secondary bright object. And this is how we mix a dish. So the Anapanasati Sutta, the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, begins with saying, Breathing in long, one knows I breathe in long. Breathing out long, one knows I breathe out long. Breathing in short, one knows I breathe in short. Breathing out short, one knows I breathe out short. So the sense of beginning just with grounding in the breath, noting its quality, adjusting it so it's comfortable. And I find to anchor the awareness to the breath, it can be very useful to count. So you can count one, one, two, two, three, three, up to 10, and then start again. If you go over 10, it tends to be a bit too much. If the verbalization of those numbers is too much, you can imagine drawing the numbers in light. One, one, two, two, three, three. If it helps, you can imagine drawing those numbers in different parts of the body. So you can start up in the upper chamber near the head, just draw the one, one, two, two, and count to 10, and then move to the torso and draw the numbers there, and then down to the third lowest chamber from about the diaphragm to the ground, and just scan the body this way, moving through it, anchoring in the breath. And then the Buddha speaks about, in the Anapanasati Sutta, becoming sensitive to the whole body and calming the bodily activity. And what this can mean is that after you've circulated through the body, if this is a technique that works for you, just coming to one centered point where you can follow the breath especially carefully and resting there, often the tip of the nose or the belly, tracing it like you would a fine silk thread, but remaining aware of the whole body, like the spider at the center of a web, but aware of the whole web. And see how long you can maintain that awareness counting. But for some people, that secondary object of that sort of broad awareness paired with the primary object of just the sense of breathing in and out, specifically at one point, it doesn't quite resonate. Some people aren't as embodied. So a good secondary object, other good secondaries, uh, involve or can often be a sense of loving kindness or the nada sound. So with a sense of loving kindness, with each of these objects, sometimes the mind will be calm and you'll want to foreground just the breath if that's where your mind is drawn. But other times, the mind will become hungry for more activity and that's when you can foreground the secondary, more active object, such as loving kindness, and let the breath just remain in the periphery, maybe giving 10% of your attention to it or checking in with it every now and again. And when you're cultivating, say, metta, loving kindness, the goal is a sense of warmth and kindling care in the heart. But when the Buddha gave ingredients for this dish you're cooking, he spoke about three types of activity. There's citta sankara, which is mental activity, and this is perceptions and feelings. So this would be uh, imagining someone that you're trying to spread loving kindness to, using a recollection or an image to kindle that sense of warmth. So you might imagine someone you care for gazing at you with goodwill. You might imagine someone who just naturally gives rise to this sense of love. You might imagine someone you're having difficulty with, but imagine holding their hand when they're five years old and then holding their hand on their deathbed. The second ingredient the Buddha gave was vachi sankara, which is verbal activity. And this is phrases you recite internally. So along with that recollection, can you find a word which really initiates that sense of love? Maybe it's friendliness, forgiveness, kindness. Find the one that kind of resonates. And finally, there's kaya sankara. This is bodily activity. And this is just the felt sense of the body. This is a sense of warmth in the heart, for example. So 
as Chitta Sankara uh, mental activities and Vachi Sankara verbal are both a bit more coarse. And as that sense of warmth and metta kindles in the heart, you can let those fall away and just remain with that sense of warmth, the kaya sankara. And if it helps, you can put one hand to the heart and just use a nonverbal sense of care. That can really help. And after you've done that, you might find the mind is ready just to rest again in the sense of just the breath following it. And you might toggle back and forth between this primary and secondary. You might take a bite of rice and then a bite of curry. But it's useful to know that when you're mixing this dish, these are the three ingredients, chitta sankara, vachi sankara, kaya sankara, mental activity, verbal activity, bodily activity. These are your ingredients. And that works for many different meditations. For example, you might find you can follow the breath without any word or mantra or counting. That's, but maybe you do need to apply these drawn letters or recite internally the numbers, sorry. And this is uh, Chitta Sankara and Vachi Sankara at work. Another really important secondary to try is called the Nada sound, and it's the sound of silence, a gentle ringing right below the auditory landscape. And if you can't hear it, it's worth just trying to put in earplugs uh, once and try to pick it out. Or when you're calm, try to listen. It's always there. And if you begin to give attention to it, it will grow louder. And uh, Ajahn Amaro can hear it you know, through power tools. It becomes brighter and brighter. So this is a powerful secondary as well, along with the breath. There's other secondaries you can mix in. You can try recollection of death. You can bring to mind good acts you've done in the past. Um, but the point is you want the sense of experimentation and brightening of the mind and interest. So just to encourage people that it's easy to get caught in or become enamored, and rightly so, with the more theoretical teachings that the Buddha gave us, and to forget to apply our minds and interest to just what we're doing on the cushion every day and in our daily lives to maintain the sense of awareness, to bring a bright sense of serenity to the heart. But this is really where um, our practice gathers momentum. And uh, it's important to be meditating uh, 20 minutes a day at the minimum. Um, and just to say that I've noticed sea changes in people's practice after 20 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day, and an hour and a half a day. Um, the hour and a half is a hard one, but you can split it up 45 minutes in the morning, 45 minutes in the afternoon. Um, but just to say that for these three months of the rains retreat, if you do want to take on a slightly higher determination for the amount of time to sit, it can be a really meaningful chance to do that, to see how the quality of your life changes when you're taking a second every, uh, every morning to come back to your center, to cultivate this stillness of heart. And only the bright, happy heart can truly comprehend dukkha and release it. So I wish everyone the best of luck in their practice and uh, in the coming three months. All right, so I know many of you have heard that talk before, but I think it's kind of important to come back to these fundamentals um, of practice regularly and remember them. We have a chance for questions now. So if people want to raise their hand, we'll run the mic over to you. And um, also, if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand, and we can call on you there. Thank you very much. Out of curiosity, with the chanting book that we were chanting this morning, um, I noticed a lot of um, 
not rhythms, but measures. It felt like measures. There was lots of numbers that were associated in this discussion today. I would like to know more about your thoughts about the emphasis on the different numbers. There's fours, there's twelves, there's tens. There's these different numbers. I'm wondering if there's any specific uh, significance in regarding the numbers. Are they numbers of um, opening further awareness um, in the mind and to, to um, paying attention to those subtleties? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's still the case now in Thailand, but maybe 30, 40 years ago, if you are giving a Dhamma talk about numbers, you say there are four noble truths and three phases of those four noble truths and 12 aspects, then people listening will put lottery money on four, three, one, two. But uh, yeah, the Buddha didn't give them for that reason. Um, it's not especially mystical. Um, each one of these lists are really practical. I mean, framing, the Buddha talked about framing our whole existence in terms of these Four Noble Truths rather than framing our lives in terms of my story and who I think I am and who you think I am, et cetera. It's just, is there suffering? And how am I causing myself suffering? And how do I not do that? Um, in terms of the three aspects, that's when the Buddha said, with regards to each of these Four Noble Truths, there are three things, well, um, each one of them has its own duty so with regards to the uh, first noble truth, we're to know it. So most people, when you feel dukkha, all you want to do, when you feel suffering, any kind of pain, all you want to do is get rid of it. Whereas the Buddha said, uh, that has no end, but if you just understand it. So with regards to the first noble truth, we understand it. That's the duty. Um, with regards to the second noble truth, the cause of suffering, craving, uh, the different types of craving that we have, the duty is to abandon it rather than just following after it, which is what most people do most of the time. With regards to the third noble truth, the cessation, the ending of dukkha, we're to realize it, come to understand the full letting go of craving. And then the path, our duty is to develop it. So each one of them, although it, it might ring of numerology or something like that, uh, they're all quite, quite practical. And um, yeah, it does a little bit read like a puzzle um, but if you read modern commentaries, Ajahn Suchito has one. Basically, most teachers will have a commentary on this sutta. Uh, Ajahn Suchito's is a book called The Dawn of the Dhamma, where he actually illustrates, he does like an illuminated manuscript that he drew himself, painted himself, and goes into and describes each of these numbered parts and the whole discourse. So it's, it's worth looking into and, and understanding more. Ajahn? No, I, that's... I mean, just the chance to dive into the Four Noble Truths again is, it's long poor Suchita says, no teaching is complete until you've touched the Four Noble Truths. But we really like lists in the Theravada and, uh, and in the Buddhist teaching in general. And it can be interesting to encounter all the numbers at first, but over time you begin to appreciate when memory operates much better when you have a schema and this is what the Buddha gives us, is instead of a schema of self and the world, it's these other ways of overlaying experience. And one definition of mindfulness, sati, is connecting experience to a framework. So he's giving you all these different frameworks to try. And over time, they have this staying power that, you know, a poetic verse, however nice it is, just doesn't have. Um, so they're very practical and they're very powerful. And they're a lens through which to see the world. And Speaking of building the ship, you know, if you get an instruction manual and it's saying, you know, build the ship like you would uh, smell a flower, you know, like, <laughs> Rumi's great to read, but <laughs> how are you going to actually build this ship? How are you going to become skilled in the mental states? And, and this is where the numbers are very useful, the practicality. A Zoom question. Yes, Bante. Bante, I'm happy to join this session. I think today, a range retreat is going to be started, I think. That's true. And uh, uh, you have mentioned about uh, 
the six R process like uh, recognize, release, relax, re smile, return, and repeat. I would like to just uh, elaborate about this with your permission. Can I? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, what I do is like I practice uh, loving kindness meditation. Like whenever we practice loving kindness meditation, we sit for a meditation, some distraction will come in general for uh, new beginners or uh, new students. Whenever we get distraction, first of all, we recognize Recognize that mind got distracted. Then release. Release is coming out from the distraction by not involving this thought. Then relax. Relaxing the tightness present in the head and mind. The relax is very important step because uh, each craving process is determined by the tightness present in our mind and body. Relax. Then come back with a smile. The smile. Then return to the, our object of meditation of loving kindness. Then repeat the same thing whenever we get distracted. This is the process which we follow. We call it as six R's. Recognize. Release. Like by coming, coming back from the thought. Then relax the tightness present in the head and mind. Then repeat smile then return then repeat the same process smiling is very important part which we uh, which we uh, assume like we can keep a little smile like uh, if you see buddha we have a little smile on the face of the buddha that is a happy state happy state of abiding uh, just i want to share this thing because uh, bante told about uh, these things six hours Thank you. Thanking you for the opportunity. Wishing all happiness to all. Thanking you. Sahadu. Thank you. No, I, I hope we all will have remembered these six hours by the end of this session. <laughs> Some six hours at least. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk today. I appreciated it. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the path towards and the sensation of the last two of the divine abidings, so um, sympathetic joy and uh, equanimity. I just want kind of your experience, your take on those. Thank you. Yeah, the third divine abiding or third heart, uh, the third Brahma Vihara, uh, mud, Mudita. Uh, the word is related to the Pali word for soft for soft, softening. And for me, that's the primary characteristic of that third noble truth and both physical, a physical softening and a mental softening. Uh, the Abhidhamma goes into that and says every wholesome mental state has this aspect of both a, a mental and a physical softening and tuning, being able to tune into that, especially around your relationship with other people, being able to soften up any kind of anxiety or um, yeah, worry that's, that's coming up, just letting all that just relax um, is really helpful. But it doesn't just, it's usually translated as sympathetic or empathetic joy, which suggests that you have to have someone else to be empathetically or sympathetically joyful for. But the Buddha says you can just practice this up to the stage of jhana just by yourself. So you can just do it gladdening the mind is what's used in the, the chanting book. So this softening, that's one aspect of the third. And the fourth of equanimity or equipoise, uh, yeah, the, the poise of that, the kind of upright, not leaning in either direction. So I think having a, a physical correlate to the mental, our idea of these, it's good to be able to ground it in the body as well. So a softness and a balance or an uprightness for those third and fourth ones. Also, if people need to stand up, I know we're almost uh, at an hour and a half. Um, just to add on, I think that was a really good description. And I would just say that sympathetic joy can be the hardest one because, you know, jealousy is pretty seductive. Um, and there's just some phrases which I find really useful. Um, 
one of them is a, a Christian saying, actually, that the less well-known, the bigger the angel. And there's something about stepping into this other strata of goodness, which you, when you begin practicing Dhamma, where you can really have faith that there's this quiet goodness of growing underneath the surface, and you really see it shine through people. And in your own experience, after that kind of desire to, you know, step into a group when you feel left out or to be as prominent or well-liked as X, which is the real block to mudita, right? The block to sympathetic joy because it's hard to appreciate someone else's well-being when you're feeling left out or less than. But this acknowledgement that when you let that pass, there's this quiet, gentle sense of majesty waiting on the other side of grace. And to, to really tune into that over time and see how when you go against the stream in that way, there is this quiet sense of gentle, reliable, sweet goodness that people really are sensitive to in these circles. And I find getting more and more faith in that and seeing it manifest this sort of quiet majesty in people opens up a door to mudita because then you can really rejoice when someone else gets acknowledged or has something good happen without that same sense of intuitive competition, which is so ingrained in us. We're constantly measuring our status against others. And just to understand there's a new game below the surface being played here, that a game's the wrong word. There's something much deeper below the game. So I find that's an opening to, to mudita. And equanimity, it's just worth referencing that upeka etymologically is related to the word for uh, to look closely, so to watch closely. And I think that's a really useful analog for equipoise, is watching experience very closely with care for when you can actually make a difference. Does that help? Okay. I think we have room for one, one more. Bree. Hi. Um, I'm curious what the role, if any, uh, intuition plays into our practice. Is it synonymous with intuitive awareness? Is it synonymous with chitta? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, for me, I, I think it does dovetail. It's either a part of uh, an aspect of of wisdom, all these different words for wisdom, um, panya, discernment, anya, knowing, and it's just a very fast, there, we've talked, I think, before about, the Buddha talks about six or seven different types of panya, there's, or discernment, there's discernment which is quick, uh, kippa panya, there's discernment which is deep, is gambira panya, there's the discernment which is able to jump and figure something out just in the moment. And there's great wisdom. And I think intuition has aspects of, of each of those. Um, so I think th there's absolutely a place for intuition on the path. And for people who maybe don't feel so intuitive, there's also a place just for analytical knowing, for being able to know by the numbers. If you just memorize these lists, you know, that's not, um, yeah, it's not necessarily the case that Intuition is inherently better than some kind of analytical knowing, um, but they're both, they can both be important and we can play to our strengths, so. No, I mean, that's such a deep question. I've heard someone say intuition is karma. I don't know how much I agree with that, but it's, I think it has some relevance just where when you, sometimes there's something very deep guiding you that's intuitive and, um, one thing I find very interesting is in the suttas, there's a lot of language about harmony, harmonizing with those around you, with the Dhamma, with Sila. And, and for me, that's one of the, the best languaging, which is in the suttas to some extent, about harmonizing with that internal song, you know? And you can really feel more and more when you're out of tune. Um, so yeah, of these it is said, of those who dwell out, out of harmony, such a one dwells in harmony. Um, I, I find that's a beautiful place you find it in the suttas. And certainly I, I feel guided by those, that kind of internal thing. But I think it's worth noting in the Kalama Sutta, you know, this 
internal sense of wholesome and unwholesome is raised up as a criteria for making decisions. But the Buddha also says, what do the wise praise and what do they censure? So also looking at what wisdom, uh, what the wise would say. And then after that, he raises up developing loving kindness. And just to notice that loving kindness is such a pure, simple state that it can serve as a mirror. And if you're unsure about a decision or what to do, and then you find yourself in a place of just gentle metta, you might find that there's a clarity in that state that's really valuable too.